My name is Abigail. Open your Bible and read it with Brother David. I'm going to invite you to make your way today for just a few moments to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, chapter 13. Book of Genesis, chapter 13. As we go through God's narrative, look at the next character, if you will, as we walk through the person of Lot. As we get an understanding of the person of Lot, and and there's lots of things we could talk about, but today we're going to talk mainly about the, the, the duality of Abram and Lot in this passage, and we'll address a few things as we proceed forward. Uh, Technically, if you were going by notes, I would have five points, so listen quickly. We'll move through, get an understanding of just the life of Lot. Genesis chapter 13, the entirety of the chapter, all 18 verses, out of respect for God's word, if you're able to stand for its reading, I would invite you to do so. Genesis chapter 13, beginning in verse number 1. If you're ready for God's word, would you say, Amen. Amen. And so Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, and he and his wife went all that belonged to him and Lot with him. Abram was very rich in livestock and in silver and in gold, and he went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. The land could not sustain them while dwelling there together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. There was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And Now the Canaanite and the Pezzarite were dwelling there in the land then. So Abram said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go right, or if to the right, then I will go left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of Jordan, and there it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, And Lot journeyed eastward, thus they separated from each other. Abram settled or dwelt in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Verse 13, now the men of Sodom were wicked and exceedingly and and, and great sinners against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot separated from him, now lift up your eyes. Look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise and walk through the land, through the length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent, came to dwell at the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar. To the Lord. Father, today, in our reading and our passage in your text, may we be encouraged, may we be challenged, may we see your face, your hand, your understanding of your love and your grace. May we see ourselves and be transformed by the renewing of our mind from what we read, learn, and understand today. May we lead out of here differently than we came in, closer drawn to you. God, our prayer is that this morning, your word would speak to us in your word only. May I be moved out of the way, and anything that would come from me may it be stricken from the record of our memory. May we all hear, know, and understand today, is thus saith the Lord our God. We pray all of this for your sake, for your glory, and in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen, and you may be seated today. Well, today as we talk about Lot, Lot's choice, Lot had to make a choice. They were in a position in a place where some things had to happen. We find ourselves coming into chapter 13 where 
Abram and Sarai and Lot and the whole gang had gone down to Egypt and they came back and, 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 and we find themselves, okay, we're back where we need to be, back where God called us to be, and we want to move forward and do what God has called us to do. Get to the place where that a choice has to be made. And you read that in the text we just read through. But Abram said, look, choose. Whatever you want, wherever you want to go, you go and I'll go the other way. So there's not a problem. Lot had to make a choice. And just like us, we have to choose every day. Every day, we have to make choices. Every day, we have to make a choice. Am I going to get up or am I not going to get up? Sometimes our choice is, listen, I'm going to get up, but my body says no. Sometimes the covers of the bed say no. None of y'all ever have those kind of covers? Or that the alarm goes off and it's time to get up and the covers say no? And they just stay wrapped around you and you can't get up? Yeah. We all have to make that choice. We have to make choice on what we're going to wear, where we're going to go. Make choices of whether we're going to drive this way or drive that way, what route we're going to take. I've driven the road between Dallas and Houston like many of you have several times. And there's always construction where? Corsicana. Always. Since I was a child, coming down from Oklahoma City to visit Grandma and Grandpa, visit Granny down here in Houston, always Corsicana. Well, if you've been that way a few times, you know in Ennis you can take 287 and go up and around. You go the other direction, you can get on 75 and keep going up. Or you can go to Centerville and hit 7 and go through Marlin and Cossie and get over to 35 and go north and get to Dallas. There's all kinds of ways you can get there. But you have to make a choice when you leave. This is the direction I'm going. Some of it may be based on Bucky's in Madisonville and you have to stop and get beaver nuggets. Maybe Centerville where you stop at Woody's and get beef jerky. Or you stop at the Holy of Holies in Fairfield and eat lunch at Sam's Buffet. See, when we travel, I know you can't tell by looking, we travel based on groceries. It's not the gas tank, it's the me tank. Y'all don't look spiritual. We make choices. Lot has to make a choice. And our choices are predicated and based on a certain number of things. In our spiritual life, our choices are made. According to Galatians chapter 5, there are two fruits. One is the fruit of the flesh, Galatians 5.18. One is the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. The end result of our choice falls in one of those two categories. But for most of us, we find ourselves like Paul in Romans chapter 7. The things I do are what I don't want to do, and what I don't want to do is what I do. Because the war that happens between the flesh and the spirit becomes activated and aggravated the more that we live our lives. And I see within the framework of Lot's choice a lot of similarities with what we have to do every day. I want us to look at this and get an understanding of this passage of Scripture. Lot's choice, Lot's choice was predicated, made, and hinged on a few things. Number one, Lot's choice was made from the same past as Abram. If you read verses 1 and verse 3, we understand this. Lot was with Abram. Go back to Genesis 12. Go back to the last part of Genesis 11. You see Lot with Abram. When Lot or Abram left Ur of the Chaldees, guess who was with him? Lot was dragging along behind him. Now, I don't know, some of y'all are well-seasoned in life enough to remember old Chuck Jones cartoons with Spike the dog, which was a big bulldog, and there was the little yippy dog. Y'all know what a yippy dog is, right? The wind blows and it yips. The cheese wrapper opens and it yips. 42 miles away, somebody sneezes and the dog yips. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You remember the cartoon where the little dog is jumping? What are we going to do today, Spike? What are we going to do? What do we... Y'all remember that? Man, y'all need to watch more cartoons. I don't know. I say, I told you it would be about 20 minutes. She wouldn't talk to me all morning. I said, save it up because you can talk later. 
I don't know if Lot was like the little yippy dog jumping over Abram's back. Where are we going today, Abram? Where are we going? Where are we going? What? I don't know. I don't know if it was like that or if Abram said, you're going with me because you're not any good at home. I, we, don't, we don't see that or understand that. But Lot goes with him and begins to be drug, drug along with Abram, lumped in together. And the choice that Lot makes later on that day, that afternoon, that life, is based on and predicated not anything different than Abram already had been through. Lot was in the exact same position as Abram and the herdsmen and Sarai and all of the, herd, the, the, the shepherds, all of those that were with them. Lot made his decision not based on a completely different set of information. Lot came out of Ur of the Chaldees. Lot had wandered around to Bethel and to Ai and to Hebron. Lot had gone to Egypt. Lot had gone everywhere that Abram had gone. He had engaged the same way. He had been involved in the same things. His past was exactly the same. Now, different parents. Lived in a different house. But his upbringing, the socioeconomic group that he was in, the values, everything was the same. And he makes his choice in exactly the same footprints and footsteps as Abram had walked. Not anything different. I love the language that's used because it says, and Lot went with him. In our lives, in our Christianity, in the life of Lot and Abram, there are folks that we are intrinsically linked with. You remember back, there have been friends and acquaintances and loved ones in your life that for a span of time, you walked with. You may still have the best friend you had in high school. You may still have close people, that, close relationships with folks that you've worked with for however many dozens of years. Folks within the framework of church that you grew up with and have attended with and, and there is a special bond there you work together and with. It doesn't matter how long you've done that. Every day you've got to make the choice. Am I going to work with, work with, work with, or work against? Not work as a part of. Lot's choice was made from the same past as Abram. Not only that, but Lot's choice was made in the same place as Abram. It wasn't like Lot was in California. Abram was in Maine. And they talked over Skype. They didn't use Zoom. They have to figure out, okay, what are we going to do this week? Where are we going to go? No. It was a face-to-face Place, but it wasn't just that they were in the same location. It wasn't just that they were in approximate uh, nearness to one another. No, it had to do with the fact that they were both from the exact same place physically, fiscally, socially. The Scripture says that Lot had all the same stuff that Abram had, didn't it? In verse, verse number 5, Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks, and he had herds, and he had tents. <laughs> he had all the same stuff. Abram and Lot were equal. And we know and understand that, well, number one, what the Scripture says, but we also get the, the, the relation of what happens later, that Lot was a rich, wealthy person just like Abram was, and what they found themselves in was in a similar position. It's not like Lot had to make a choice because he was second best. Lot didn't make his choice based on the fact that he was just good enough or he would never be good enough. We make decisions all the time based on our concept of ourselves and our abilities. 
If God was to call into our lives and say, you need to be involved in this, or this is the direction you should go, what does the Scripture say? You will hear a voice behind you say, this is the way, walk in it. It says, don't turn to the right, don't to the, turn to the left. That's why we need the Word of God to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, so we can see the next few steps ahead of us and work and walk and do. But we don't come to the position of making the choice to walk. Oft times... We make the wrong choice because we don't think we're good enough to do what God has called us to do. How many of you have seen that poster? You've heard the preacher preach it. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips those that are called. While that's a great sentiment, it's only half true. God does equip those who are called but God calls the equipped. If God has given you the spiritual gift of hospitality and giving, and you don't have two nickels to rub together, how can God call you to give what you don't have to give? If God has blessed you richly, He calls you earned, you made, you had, and utilize it, what you have already been equipped with for the benefit of those around you. And I'm not just talking about financially. There's things we all have and things we all engage in and things we all know and understand that at times God uses us and motivates us to use what we have for His kingdom. But the most beneficial thing we can remember is that God will meet all of our needs according to the riches of Christ Jesus in glory. Which means if God calls us and says, you need to go, as he said here, you need to go to Haran, you need to go to Ai, you need to go to Bethel. Well, God, I can't do it. And we turn into Moses. Moses. You remember the narrative of Moses, right? God said, okay, go back to Egypt. Uh, I can't. Can't read too well, write too well, can't talk too well. Surely there's better people qualified. And God said, you know, you're, you're, you're right. I'll find somebody else. No. God gave him leprosy. God made a snake. God turned a bush on fire that wasn't really on fire. God convinced his wife that he wasn't having a fever dream. God took care of him. God said, just trust me. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Moses had to make a choice. He fought it every way he could. You remember the narrative of Jonah. Go to Nineveh. I ain't going to Nineveh, God. You don't know who those people are. You remember Gideon threshing wheat in the, in the press floor down in the valley where nobody could see him because he was terrified of everybody? And the angel appears and says, Hail, mighty warrior. I think you got the wrong guy, chief. Choices had to be made. Our choices spiritually, just like Lot's, are based not on some hierarchy or some level of spirituality, our choices have to be made from the same place that everyone else's choice is made, and it is this, God will take care of me. But we make our choices to do or to not do for the wrong reason. We need to stand firm in where we are, in the place where we are, understanding we are just the same in the eyes of God as everybody else, we're just sinners saved by grace. And if God wants me to be involved in it, He will get me to the place I need to be. Number three, we see that Lot's choice was made around the same people. Lot didn't have a different group of friends. Lot didn't put it to a vote on social media. He didn't use TikTok filters or Snapchat filters or Instagram filters. 
change his voice and his facial structure and put a post up that said, okay, should I go right or left? Vote here. Many of you have seen, maybe been involved with it, where that when young ladies, when young couples decide they're going to do a gender reveal party. When did that become a thing? Does anybody remember one day when somebody flipped a switch and decided everybody in the universe has to outdo everybody else to have a gender reveal party to find out if something is pink or blue? I don't remember that. Now, maybe it's because I was doing everything else. I don't remember that growing up as a kid. But it's now the thing. And they, they have the weirdest things to do that with. Exploding golf balls. They now, they have uh, uh, balloons that pop like four times and they're different colors until you get to the inside. Laser light shows. You remember the thing? Y'all seen them, right? At Christmas time where you can drive through the neighborhoods and you park for like 15 minutes and you set your radio to 88.1 or whatever and it plays music and the lights flash to the music. Do you know they do that for gender reveals now? It's like a 30-minute video that you have to watch. And it's laser lights and smoke bombs and all these things, and, and all of a sudden the garage door turns a color. And it's like, woo! You could have just told me that, and I didn't have to leave the house. We, we live in this world now where that when you're going to do that, you put a poll up on social media that if you think it's a boy, click this, if a girl, click this, and you count and you... Well, we've got 42 for this and 52 for that or back and forth, and it becomes this contest. And all your friends get involved with it, and they share it on their pages, and then they get people that you don't know to vote on the gender of your child. I have to tell you this. This is just for free. Your vote doesn't change what God has already done. If you say all, you can say all night long, I want a boy, guess what? You don't get to choose. God made the choice. He's the one who's put it together. So you can celebrate that, woohoo, but you don't get a vote. You put all these things and it's friends and all the loved ones and everybody congratulates and woohoo, everything's great. Lot made his choice based around the exact same people that Abram was around. They were around each other. They were linked in with one another. How do we know that? The Scripture says the land could not sustain them both. There were so many people involved together that they were eating them out of house and home. There wasn't enough water. There wasn't enough grass. There wasn't enough sustainability. There wasn't enough land area. Now, how wealthy do you have to be to have so many cattle, so many sheep, so many camels, whatever the livestock was, that both of you together are literally stripping the land bare. There's not enough water for you both to have enough to drink. We began to see multiplication occur. Choices have to be made. What are we going to do here? What are we going to do there? And we find Lot in the position for that a choice is given. We're from the same place from the same family, from the same people, we're around the same friends, we have the same socioeconomic group, we're in the same ranking, we're in the same social status, we're exactly the same across the board. One of us has got to go somewhere else. Why? Because we hate each other? No. Because we don't like each other? No. Because we are so uh, enormous. We have gotten to the place where we have to have a division or there is going to be problems. And so Lot makes a choice. Lot makes a choice. I know this is terrible grammar, but to stay in the theme of the letter P, I had to put this. They, they, Lot's choice was not the same pick as Abram. You, you, you got that, right, when we read through here? Abram said, whichever way that you pick, you choose which by culture map was the wrong choice. What should have happened was when Abram said, according to the custom and the tradition of the day, to the younger person you choose, Lot's answer should have been, no, I will abide by whatever you say. Abram gave him the choice. I love the language that he says. He says, is not the whole land open for you? 
You can go anywhere you want to go. This is, I, I saw this on social media. And it said, uh, it was a picture of this beautiful tropical island scene. And there was a cruise ship. And it said uh, something to the effect of my uh, heart's desire for vacation and you move to the second picture, and it's a similar background, and it's an iron laid sideways to mimic the cruise ship, and it said, my bank account's desire for a vacation. We want to be somewhere, but we don't have the luxury of wealth to just go do whatever we want to do. Lot didn't have that problem. When, when Abram says the whole world is open to you, he didn't mean that there's nobody in existence anywhere else on the planet. We use the term, you've heard this before, the world is your oyster. You can do what you want to. You have enough means, enough wealth, enough opportunity that if you want to go to Barbados and spend the rest of your life, you can do that. Everything is open and available to you. You just tell me which way you're going. I'll go the other way. That way we're not stripping the land here. We'll go to where that both of us can succeed in our plans and the things that are laid out in front of us. Make your choice. Pick. What we read is that Abram said, I'm going to go whichever direction is opposite of you. If you read through there, in verse number 11, Lot looked over there and thought it was nice, and he went eastward. You read that, right? Went east. Well, if Abram was true to his word, which we know because of geography, he was. One went east, one went west. Now, inherently in that choice, there's no, there's no problem there, right? Everything was laid open. You can go wherever you want to. And so Lot looked around. And he looked and he said, man, that place over there sure is nice and green. Not only is it lush and green and nice, but the scripture says this, it even looked like the Garden of Eden. That's lush. That's green. That's nice. That means there's plenty of water, plenty of food, plenty of groceries for the animal, plenty of raw materials to build with. It looks like a fantastic place. There's just one little place that gets stuck in the language that's given. Because the direction he went while beautiful and lush and had all of the things that he desired, contained a small problem. Well, two small problems that wound up being not so small in a couple of pages of Scripture. And it wasn't even the place. Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, the land didn't have a problem. It's the people that were in the land that had a problem. They were exceedingly wicked. Not just a little bit wicked. It wasn't like they just had one little flaw. They were greatly sinning against the Lord. Now from their vantage point, who knew what he could see or couldn't see? If they're that wealthy, that large, that rich, and there's all of those, then more than likely they had been there or heard about it. They understood what was kind of going on around there. They understood the Canaanites were there. The Pezzarites were there. They understood who was around them. Lot makes a choice. We understand and know that as he began to move and to go forward, he moved to Sodom. Now, I don't know if there was a gradual thing where he went that way and moved to the Negev and then he moved over here and he moved over here and eventually he worked his way over towards Sodom or if it was the first place he went because it was a town and it had resources. What we know and understand is that the choice that Lot made in and of itself was not inherently wrong, but do you remember the narrative of Lot's life? In a nutshell, and we'll talk about it a little more when we get there, Lot's life, his wife died in probably the most weird, unconventional means of passing that could be had 
were that she turned into a pillar of salt. It's not an everyday occurrence. There's not that in the obituaries today. Not only did his wife pass in an unconventional means, but his daughters, the generation that he raised in Sodom, was so vile that his daughters got him drunk, raped him, and had his children. Oh, but it's green. It's lush. It's pleasing to the eye. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Doesn't the scripture say that in Corinthians? Choices made. Choices lived with. You say, what in the world does that have to do with us today? Because, man, that's ancient. I'm going to give you some very brief, just, just a couple of things. Okay? Just like three. Three names. Because that's all Old Testament, right? I mean, that even predates the law. This is just old. We don't have to worry about it anymore because it's not for us. I'm going to give you some New Testament stuff then, and hopefully that will fix it for you. Maybe it will make your life better. You ever heard of this guy? Anybody ever heard of Judas Iscariot? Have you seen the meme? Y'all know what a meme is, right? A picture on social media that has a joke or a deep thought and it's put on a background. Hopefully you've seen this. This is not new information. That says Judas had the best pastor, the best leader, the best teacher, the best friend. He still failed. Judas was in the same, had the same past. He was a Jew. He was in the same place. He was just in the exact same framework as all the rest of those 12 guys that Jesus called and walked around with and slept in the same room, ate at the same table, walked on the same ground, did all of the same things with. He was there for miracles. There was a point in time when Jesus sent the 12 disciples out two by two and they did miracles. Judas was not a stranger. It wasn't like he came on the scene on Tuesday and Wednesday failed. Three years he had been around the exact same thing that everybody else had been. And failed. Why? The scripture says that Satan entered into his heart. What does that mean? It means this. If we're not careful, there's a reason Ephesians chapter 4 says, be angry. It's okay to be angry. But in your anger, do not sin. Why? Because you give the devil a foothold. And when he gets a foothold and he worms into a crack, he causes a split and division. It means we, do, we don't lose our salvation, but what we do is we have a faith that becomes useless because our faith has no works, because our faith is so wound up in trying to fix everybody else's problems that we neglect, as Jesus said, the plank in our own eye. And we make choices based not on the right information, but on what seems right to us. And that's what Judas did. He made a decision based on what he thought and he wanted. And if you don't know anything else, you can look no further than Mary at Simon the leper's house when the nard was broken open and the thing was poured on Jesus' feet and she wiped his feet with her hair. And Judas complained. Why wasn't this sold for 300 denarii? Why didn't we make 300 bucks off of this? We could have given it to the poor. And even that, he said, the Scripture says, he didn't say that because he was concerned about the poor. He said that because his fingers were in the money bag and he wanted a little extra off the top. You say, well, that's still kind of old. I mean, that's, we, we know what happened to him. What about Alexander the coppersmith? Alexander the coppersmith is written of in the book of Acts as being a member of the church. Did you hear that? Did, did you understand that? Alexander and Hymenaeus. Paul named them out by name. Members of the church. And when you find the end of Paul's life in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul is writing to 
young Timothy, and he says, come, go by Carpus' house, get the parchments. Demas has left me. This guy's over here. Cretans is going over here, and we're over here and doing all these things. And what we find is in the middle of all of these people within the church, uh, Alexander the coppersmith who did us much harm is named. Well, how could he do any harm if he wasn't a member of the church? He was there. He was involved. And he tried to oust Paul. And he tried to say, Paul is wrong. The scriptures are wrong. What Jesus said is wrong. Listen to me. I've got special wisdom. Same place, same background, same language, same everything. He got it wrong. I'll give you one that's a, a, good, a good story because none of those are very good. Let me give you one that actually is good. Do you remember John Mark? Do you, do you remember John Mark? Paul's first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas are like, hey, let's go. God has called us to go be missionaries. Well, let's go be missionaries. Barnabas says, let's take my cuz. John Mark gets in and they start going and the first place they stop, somebody may have said ugly things to them. May have shut the door in their face. May have had an ugly business meeting at church that night. Whatever it was, John Mark quit. He made the choice and he left. Time for the second missionary journey and Paul's like, hey, let's go back. There's other places we need to go. We need to go check on some of those ones we went to the first time. And, and Barnabas says, well, let's take John Mark. And Paul said, ain't never happening again. I'm not taking that boy. He made the choice. His upbringing... His background, everything about who he was. He was sitting under the same teaching, under the same preaching, he was under the same leadership. He was going to the same place with the same folks. It was still Paul and it was still Barnabas. John Mark said, I am not going. Paul said, we're not taking him with us because the last time we went, he deserted us and he left us and he went back, left a hole where there needed to be no hole. And Barnabas said, well, I'm going, and I'm taking him with me. And Paul got Silas, and they went. Second missionary journey, Barnabas and John Mark had a missionary journey. And what happened was, God in his infinite grace, mercy, and wisdom said this, where once was two, there is now four. And I don't know what happened to John Mark. My humble opinion is John Mark got saved at some point in time. Because what do we read in the book of 2 Timothy? Hey, Timothy, when you come by and see me, <clears throat> bring John Mark. Why? So I can have somebody to throw darts at? No. So bring him because he is useful to me for service. Choices made. Decisions made. We could talk about Peter who made the decision to deny Christ three times. We could talk about Philip who was obedient to go to the chariot running down the road and share the good news of what salvation could have been. And the Ethiopian eunuch got it. And the Ethiopian eunuch went back to Ethiopia and shared his faith. We could talk about John the Revelator who on the Isle of Patmos had every right and reason to go, you know what, I'm sick of being ostracized from everybody. I want to go back home and renounce this faith. Instead, God used him to provide us the book of Revelation. 152 years ago, people who were gathered in this spot to start Magnolia Baptist Church could have said, you know what, it's too country out here. We want to move to the city and this church doesn't get founded. Choices are made every day. You have to make a choice whether or not to be here this morning. You could have stayed home, let the covers eat you. Between here and yonder, you can throw a rock and hit 14 churches if you know how to skip just right. You can make the choice as to where to be. But if our choices are made on our 
thought process. We wind up moving further and further and further away from God. And the further we get from God, the less our fire burns. And the less our fire burns, the less we share and the less warmth we have. And the less we share, the less people hear the gospel. And the less people hear the gospel, the fewer get saved. We get into the place where we wonder why we find ourselves on the border of Sodom. It's because the choices we've made have led us there. But the good news is, John, Mark, Peter, John, Paul, I'm, I'm a fascinated person by some of the minor characters we read about in Scripture. Ananias on Straight Street for me is one of those characters I can never get enough of. You remember Ananias? Paul's got scales on his eyes, he's blind, been there three days, hadn't had anything to eat, hadn't had anything to drink, hadn't spoken for three days. God comes to Ananias on Straight Street. And he says, hey Ananias, have I got a deal for you? I want you to go over to this guy's house and I want you to walk in the door and you're going to have a part in a healing service. You're going to see my work poured out and it's going to be awesome. Okay, God, who's the patient? Um, Saul of Tarsus. I'm um, God. Not sure you know who that is. Not sure you understand. But no. He's, he, he can kill me. God said go. God would have picked somebody else because God's will was for Paul to be the voice to the Gentiles. But God talked to Ananias and he went and as he walks in the door to a murderer, a thief, a criminal, someone who deserved the wrath of God for murder, someone who had violated the very law that he had sworn to protect, he walked in the door and said, Brother Saul, that's a choice. And his faithfulness led to Paul's scales falling off of his eyes. His faithfulness led to Paul being moved into position where that when he went to the deserts of Arabia for three years outside of Damascus, he could hear no one understand who Jesus Christ was and for three years got taught the gospel. Three years got taught the will of God. For three years got taught and put in a position that when he came back in, he began to share the glory of God through salvation because of Ananias, this little guy who's referenced in like three verses in all of the Bible. We today are receivers and recipients of his choice. What is your choice today? I will give it to you as Joshua did in Joshua chapter 24 verse 15 when Joshua looked at the people and he said this, choose you this day whom you will serve. You can serve those around you, the influences around you, the gods of the people around you. You can serve everything going on around you. Make your choice, but don't make it based on somebody telling you something or somebody else. You choose for yourself today whom you will serve. And you know the end of the verse. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Is that a choice you've made spiritually in your life? Have you lived your life as an Iscariot or as an Alexander? Have you lived your life as a John Mark or that you need to see yourself coming back and being useful to the service of God's glory? I invite our ladies to come and as they're making their way this direction, let me say this. The scripture is very clear and it says that everybody is, is a sinner. Romans 3.23, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. 
Romans 6, 23, the wages of that sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, 8, this is the way God chose for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is a choice that God made. You have to. That's the beauty of grace is that our salvation is the choice of God. How do we know that? Revelation says that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world was set. John chapter 1, verse 29, Jesus looks and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. He said, Nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. If I lay it down, I'll pick it up again. Why? Because I don't do the will of myself. I do the will of the one who sent me. Because of the choice that Christ made, not, not my will, but thy will be done. We are able to have salvation today if we will but choose to do it. How do we choose? Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. It's all about the choice that you make.